I think to tasbih, who wrote the question? In English. Is that what you mean? Yeah. So um, that's a fiqh question. That's a fiqh question. And I don't really know the answer to that question. But, um, you know, as I recall in our tradition, you know, people that are unable to learn Arabic, you know, they have certain licenses that are given to them. Uh, maybe the Fuqahat disagree about that, right? I know there are different statements about that. Could you help me? Uh, what is the question? So the question is, okay, can we do dhikr, right? Can we do tisbih? Can we, can we say God is the greatest, glory be to God, and so forth, right? That's what you're asking. I think that you're talking about specific Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, so usually in, in the fiqh tradition, this is a question about the way we pray. So, for example, if you can't learn Arabic, can you use English? Can you use Persian? Can you use Berber? And so forth. Or maybe you don't have to do anything. You don't have to say anything, right? Yeah, Malikis would say that, right? Malikis would say that if you can't you know, say anything, then you don't have to say anything. There are different opinions about that. Um, you know, with regard to the actual dhikr of Allah that we do, um, the Arabic language has a very special position. And, you know, one of the characteristics of the Arabic language is that the meanings of the words are manifested in the letters. And the words do amazing things. You know, so therefore, it's very important that we teach people as much as we can of the Arabic tongue, and that we honor it and use it. Uh, in our culture, wherever Islam goes, we always enrich the languages that are there. And usually we raise up one of those languages that will become a regional Islamic language. So, for example, in India, you'll have Urdu and Tamil in the south, and others as well, but especially Urdu and Tamil. These become major vehicles for Islam. In Indonesia and Malaysia, you'll have Malay. There were also other tongues, but Malay was very appropriate for Islam. Uh, you have Turkic, you have Mandinka, you have Swahili, uh, Persian. Persian's a beautiful language. Okay, so we always enrich these languages. Um, you know, when I became a Muslim, my education had been primarily in history and in languages and literature. And I loved languages and literature, and I was especially uh, interested, and I was in fact studying uh, English literature in the PhD program. And one of the things that concerned me greatly as an English speaker was the fact that poetry was basically dead in the English language. Poetry that had flourished in the past, you know, in the 19th and 20th century, it's like it dies. T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, Gerald Manuel Hopkins, uh, James Joyce, they all talk about this crisis, that what's happened to our language, where is it gone? And I was also very much affected by that. I mean, I was very concerned about that. When I became a Muslim, one of the things I felt is that if Islam ever comes to us, the English speakers, it will bring our language back to life. And one of the amazing things is that today, with millions of English-speaking Muslims in the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, this is what we see. And we see poetry alive like I could never imagine 40 years ago or 50 years ago. So Arabic has, Islam has this ability to enrich languages and to bring them back, but always these languages become paired with the Arabic language. You know, so we cultivate Arabic, we love Arabic, we learn it, we also cultivate our languages, English, French, German, whatever they may be.
But especially when it comes to things like dhikr, which is an act of ibadah, the Arabic language honestly and truthfully can do things which no other language can do. And this is why even we talk about the word Allah, which we talked about in the first lesson, you know, that we talk about the word God. The word God is, I believe, without any question, one of the ancient names of God. And it means he who is supplicated. That's what it means originally. Okay, but is the word God equal to Allah? I would never say that. Allah is very special. Okay, but God is also extremely blessed. And therefore, especially when we're speaking with English people or American people, often it's extremely polite and also communicative to speak to them and to use that beautiful word and to understand that it's the most beautiful word in their language. Okay, but when it comes to dhikr, uh, Arabic has a very special place, a very special place. And we also learn, of course for you that's not difficult, you know, you're all Arabs anyway. But uh, especially for us in the United States, in Canada, learning Arabic is really beneficial. And in fact, you know, some of our scholars talk about the roots of disbelief. As Sibari, who's one of our great scholars, talks about eight roots of disbelief. And then he adds a ninth, which is Mukhtalafihi. And he said it is ignorance of the Arabic tongue. Many scholars didn't hold that position, but some did. So knowledge of the Arabic tongue is really valuable, really valuable, and really essential to our religion. <clears throat>